Hello, I'm Dr. Laura Seymour, besides some um, flowery curtains, and I'm a stipendiary lecturer in English at St Anne's. This is a teaching post, but I'm going to talk to you about my research in this video, and my research focuses on disability, neurodiversity and performance in early modern literature, so literature from the 16th century to the early 18th century. I've written a book on disability and nonconformity in early modern English and Spanish literature more broadly, but my current project focuses specifically on neurodiversity. And neurodiversity is the idea that people with different minds, so for example autistic people, are just one variation in the human brain. And in my own understanding, it means not primarily framing such people as diverging from some dominant norm. Plenty of scholars do use the term neurodivergent though, and that can be a very useful concept too. I work particularly on what we now call autism and depression in early modern texts, and you might say that that's an anachronism. The word autism didn't exist in the Renaissance, nor did the term neurodiversity. But I work on the principle that there have always been people like us. There have always been autistic people, and there have always also been, for example, people who lived with depression, or what um, in the Renaissance was called melancholy. And I have found that texts from 400 years ago do have plenty to teach us about these different identities and states of being in the present day. Neurodiversity studies, which is a relatively new literary field, has made available new ways of understanding Renaissance texts. And as I mentioned, I'm pursuing this big project on neurodiversity at the moment, which is quite broad. So I look, for example, at rhetorical figures of repetition in Shakespeare's texts and how these can resemble autistic forms of speech like echolalia and thus how being autistic might make one a good rhetorician. Uh, I look at spiritual um, autobiographies and biographies from religious melancholics in the 1660s to 1680s and I also look at, uh, for example, legal documents from 18th century Scotland, which illustrate the challenges and the oppressions that were faced by autistic people and people with cognitive and intellectual disabilities in that era. Um, and I've picked one choice example um, from this project uh, to talk about in this video, which is a strand of the project where I take a fresh look at the Renaissance figure of the misanthrope, and specifically at the character Morose in Ben Jonson's 1609 play Epicene, or The Silent Woman. Morose is an adjective meaning gloomy or unsocial. And later in the 17th century, this word also gained what to my mind is the more positive meaning of scrupulous and painstaking. We learn right from the start of this play, in the list of characters, that Morose is a gentleman who loves no noise, and he has adjusted his environment to suit his hypersensitivity to noise. So his servants communicate in a silent gestural language, and they wear padded shoes. He's covered his door in quilts, and he lives down a narrow alley so he doesn't have to hear traffic passing by his house. The storyline of this play is that the other characters trick Morose into marrying a person that he believes to be the silent woman of the play's title. And then they torment him with a noisy after party to his wedding. And literary critics have traditionally read Morose as a misanthrope or a clown or both. And in the productions of the play that I've been researching, He's played as someone to be laughed at, and directors have often gone out of their way to encourage audiences to laugh at Morose and also to absolve them of their guilt at doing so. However, I argue, this character isn't a clown or a misanthrope. He's a reasonable fellow trying to live in a hostile world. I read him as an example of what we now call an autistic person his silent house and autistic utopia. 
And it it was later said that Johnson based this character on a real person that he actually knew. And there are various clues in the text that suggest that this character, if not this real person, was written as what we now call autistic and intended to be played and read as such. So not just Morose's hypersensitivity to noise, um, but also his love of listing specific items and um, his bluntness and um, also his hatred of small talk. So at one point he says, um, what is the point of saying hello and goodbye to people and asking them how they are? I had rather do anything, he says, than wear out time so unfruitfully. His interactions with other characters are not always pleasant for him, and this was another clue, unfortunately. So he's bullied by the other characters, as I mentioned, and he also finds it difficult to advocate for himself in court when he goes there because of what is to him its confusing and noisy environment. If we read this character as autistic, the play would have to be directed in a very different way. And this is one of the things I'm pondering in my research, how we might direct this play in the future. Reading Morose um, as autistic specifically, rather than as a misanthropal clown, has also enabled me to gain a more illuminating understanding of the play more widely. Um, one angle I've taken here is gender. When we read Morose in this new way, um, this enables us to gain, it enables us to see his relationship with his spouse in a new light as well. I'm not just interested in looking for autistic um, and melancholic and, you know, um, disabled people more widely um, in early modern literature. I'm also interested in neurodiverse met methodologies, thinking about how neurodiverse minds might approach, understand and perform early modern texts in ways that deepen everyone's understanding of these texts. Relatedly, I also research neurodiversity in teaching and learning. I'm interested in how classrooms can be made more inclusive for neurodiverse people and experiences. And this is one of the things that I try and learn about every day in an ongoing way. I love to hear others' experiences and read other people's scholarship and learn from them how we can make our discipline more celebratory of difference and disability.